Hi, it's Mr. T here and welcome to this video on organic chemistry. Um, in this video, I'm going to be going over names and properties of alkanes and it's particularly aimed at those who've already done some organic chemistry. Okay, um, so the first thing I just want to touch on and go over is how we draw organic compounds. So here's an example of an organic compound. This is the structural formula, formula of glycine. So this is an amino acid. Um, then we can draw its molecular formula. Notice that the molecular formula shows just uh, the atoms and, the, and a number down beside them that shows the number of atoms. So the structural formula is, is very good at us being able to see how all the atoms are joined to other atoms. The molecular formula just really gives us the ratio here. Um, we notice here that there are two specific functional groups. There's a carboxylic acid functional group and there's an amine functional group. And, and the functional groups are the specific parts of an um, organic molecule that gives it its special properties. Uh, in the terms of an amino acid, it allows amino acids to make peptide bonds with other amino acids and form proteins that are essential for the growth and running of our bodies. One thing to always check when we're drawing um, our organic compounds is that every single carbon that you draw has four lines or four bonds coming off it. Okay, let's look at how we name these now. Um, the first thing we're going to do when we name an organic compound is to try and work out what is the organic group that it comes from. So we have to start recognizing that. And the simplest organic group is one like this one here that only contains carbons, hydrogens, that, that means it's a hydrocarbon because that's all that it contains. And also it only has single bonds. So I can see from this that this is going to be an alkane, which means the end or the suffix of its name is going to be ane. It's going to end with the uh, ending ane. The second thing I want to do is identify the longest chain in this molecule. So the longest continuous chain. So you can look, I, if I went straight across the horizontal here, I would have one, two, three, four, five carbons in a line. That is not the longest because if I started at the bottom here and went up and across, that would give me six. And that would be my longest chain. If, now knowing this is six is the longest chain, I can then go along uh, at the bottom here just a second, and six is equal to hex. So this molecule here is, its base is hexane. It has two functional groups, one here and one here, coming off the main chain, but the main chain, the name is hexane. Okay, so now we know the, the name of the main chain here, which is hexane, we can start naming the branches that come off. Um, so the two branches that come off are these two here, and if we, um, wait, let's go back here and let me put a pointer in here. So we've got two options here. We've, we've got the main chain, but I now need to put some numbers on here so that we can have an address for where these branches come off the main line here. So I can either start numbering from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, if I number from the bottom, this is number three, and this is number five. If I number from the right, one, two, three, four, five, six, then we see that the numbers are now two and four. Now the numbers two and four are smaller than the numbers three and five, so this is the correct way that we name it, to give the smallest possible number. When we go about uh, working out what the names of these branches are, then there are um, specific names for each of the branches depending on how many carbons they have. If they have one, they're called a methyl group. If they have two, they're an ethyl group. And if they have three, they're a propyl group. In this case, we have two methyl groups. Because we have two methyl groups, these and these are two identical methyl groups, instead of saying, 2-methyl, 4-methyl, we're going to say 2,4-dimethyl because they are identical groups. 
So this name for this is going to be 2, 4 dimethyl hexane. 2, 4 dimethyl hexane. So 2 with a comma, a 4, a dash, and then dimethyl hexane, all in one word. Okay, sometimes what we want to do is we want to um, draw our formulas in a more condensed form. So we can draw a structure out like this, or if we have a kind of a shorthand way of drawing them. This is called a condensed structural formula, and you'll sometimes see that uh, uh, organic molecules are represented in this way. So here's an example of one. Now let me go over and show you why this is the same as this. The rule is here that each carbon in the main chain, we take any of the other groups or atoms that are attached to it and we put them to the right of it. So here we have C, H3. The second one is C, H2, and then CH2 and then CH3. Okay, so that seems to work quite well. Let's have another example here. So if we follow the same rule, here's our main chain. So this is CH3. Let's have a look. And then we have CH, and then we want to show this group coming off. Now we put this in a bracket to show that it is a group coming off the branch. So this is CH3, CH, bracket CH3, CH2, C, now H is here uh, directly joined to this, bracket CH3, but there's two of them, so I put a two after it. So it gets a wee bit complicated, but after using the condensed form or, or, or going between these two, they become familiar. So we often, there's another way that we use these brackets. So let's have a look at this one here. So this would, we could write this down, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. But if we wanted to just shorten this, we can do the following. We can write CH3, CH2, 4, to show that there are four CH3, uh, CH2s in a row, and then CH3. This is particularly important when we get to long molecules like found in fats and oils. And we'll look at that later in this topic. Right, so let's have a look at some isomers that are commonly associated with alkanes, but they can actually happen with any molecules, but we'll look at them here. So these are called constitutional isomers or sometimes structural isomers. Now, every organic molecule has a molecular formula. For example, C4H10 is a molecular formula. It means the molecule has four carbons and 10 H's, but this molecular formula doesn't tell us how the atoms are actually arranged. So, to actually find out all the different types of organic molecules that can have these num this number of carbons and hydrogens, I usually follow the following rules. I start drawing the longest chain. So what I mean, I'm gonna draw four carbons in a row, in a line, okay? without any branching off. So let's have a look. Here's four carbons. Cool. That's the only one with four carbons in a line. So now I'm going to start drawing three carbons. Wait a sec. So let's draw three carbons in a line and then a carbon coming off the front. I'm going to draw another three carbons, three carbons in a line and a carbon off the top three carbons in a line and carbon off the bottom. Let's actually have a look at these first two here. See these three carbons in a line? They actually look like this molecule here. When the carbons are actually bonded together, they are bonded at, they use tetrahedral angles, which is 109 degrees. So you can see you've got four different bonds coming off each of these carbons. So the angles between here are 109 degrees. So we don't actually have a straight line, but we have the zigzag. This molecule here, where it's drawn up like that, is just this molecule apart from this bond here. This, sorry, this atom has rotated. And, the, and when we have single bonds, an atom can rotate any time. That means that this depiction here and this one are just the same way. It's just this one's just a bit bent a bit more differently. So we can't say that they are different molecules. So we must cross that one out. And when we look at this one here, represented by this ball and stick figure here, and this one here, we can see that if we just flip them horizontally, right? If we just flip uh, this downways, we can see these are actually the exact same molecule. So we can cross one of them out. 
So what we actually have is I only have for C4H10 two distinct molecules that are bonded together in two different ways. Now I've worked that out just using the framework, I can add the hydrogens and what I get is I get the two molecules. These are the only two constitutional isomers for C4H10. Now how do you know that they are um, different molecules? You'll know because when you go to name them they'll have different names. This first one its name is called butane. The second one its name is not butane. It is methyl propane. Two methyl propane but you don't need the two because methyl propane can only ever have the methyl group coming off the second carbon. Okay, what about some physical properties? So this is, this gets kind of uh, a bit harder here, the, this idea. So physical properties. So basically, if I have an alkane, the bigger the alkane gets, the bigger its molar mass, and the more, uh, the bigger and more likely the electrons of that molecule are imbalanced at any time, that you get more on one side than the other. So you get a stronger temporary, temporary dipole influence, or you get stronger temporary temporary dipole intermolecular attractions. This is when you have a larger molar mass. That means that there will be stronger attractions for something like an octane compared to a methane. When you also, when you look at organic molecules, you have to look and see if they have electronegative elements like oxygen, nitrogen, and the halogens, because they will create dipole moments. They'll creates a slight, because these are more electronegative, they'll become slightly negative, and the other um, part of the bond will become slightly positive, and they can form permanent dipole-dipole attractions, or they can form polar molecules, and this will also increase the attraction. And the last thing here is that if you have a, these nitrogen or oxygen atoms, and you also have a hydrogen attached to one of these, you can form something called a hydrogen bond that can be up to um, uh, um, up to 10 times larger, larger, an order of magnitude bigger than what these types of attractions are. And they occur in amines and hydroxy functional groups, um, and they make very strong hydrogen bonds. Now, all of these types of things, the stronger the bond, the larger the melting point or the larger the boiling point. So if you have strong hydrogen bonds happening, it's most likely got a larger boiling point and it's likely to be a liquid or a solid. If you don't have this polar polar, permanent polar polar interaction, you don't have this hydrogen bonding and you have a small molar mass, you're definitely gonna have a gas. Okay, what about solubility? So this is another tricky concept here. So something only dissolves, like, let's talk about water. Something will only dissolve in water if the substance that you're trying to put between the water molecules forms stronger or equal bonds with the water molecules than the water molecules form with themselves. So you have to think about it like the water molecules are sitting around and they have these strong hydrogen bond attractions to each other. And in order to let something else in between them, Okay, in their structure, the bonds have to be just as strong. So you can't you can't put something within the water or inside water that's not going to be attracted to it significantly. So when you try and put a non-polar substance and you put it in water, it's only going to have very weak attractions, very these weak temporary attractions to the water molecules, and when you put try and place one in between they break the hydrogen bond that was strong attraction you took a lot lot of energy to break that bond when you formed the new weak bond you only produced a little amount of energy so overall it took heaps of energy to put it in well something that takes heaps of energy to make happen doesn't happen spontaneously it means we can't get it to dissolve and in fact the only way to get things to dissolve that are really struggling to dissolve is to heat them up because when we heat them up, we're giving them energy to overcome that energy barrier. Now, this is a really difficult concept, and it's one you'll most likely have to go and look back to what I've talked about at the end of this topic, or maybe at the end of the year of um, your year's work of chemistry. Okay, and that's all really I have to say in this video. Next video, I'm going to have a look at alkenes and alkynes. So, um, yeah, good luck with that.